So, welcome to uh, the University of Notre Dame for this conference on the question, the debate about whether or not foreign investors can sue the United Kingdom for Brexit. Um, there's really no end to the number of conferences one can go to about Brexit. So, we tried to be creative and find a topic that the international arbitration community has been talking about quietly, but it's never actually been done in a sort of formal public sense about can you use existing jurisprudence of international arbitration and investment arbitration to make the argument that some of the conduct that we anticipate that will happen in the United Kingdom could give rise to investment arbitration claims. So we have a great uh, group of speakers for this discussion. Uh, and I'll just very, very quickly open up the uh, discussion and then leave it to Suzanne to give more details about the framing of the issue. So this event is co-sponsored by um, uh, Voltaire and Fieta, and we thank uh, them very much for their co-sponsorship. We also have support from the Oil, Gas, and Energy Law Center, and, and this is being recorded and will be posted uh, not only on the Clear Arbitration Law website, but also on the OGMID website as well. So it'll be available to a broader audience um, following the event. The uh, speakers that we have today are not representing their own personal views. They've been asked to take a position as if they were in the shoes of the lawyers for the respondent state or the lawyers for the uh, foreign investors. It's not necessarily representing their own personal views about the matter. Um, and then after the debate and during the Q&A, we're going to actually ask you all to vote using uh, anonymous polling technology whether or not you think that there are viable claims for foreign investors to sue the United Kingdom in the event of a hard Brexit. I'm not going to go into details on the bios. You have all of the bios in front of you uh, there of the speakers, but I just want to very briefly introduce them. So Suzanne Spears, um, a partner with uh, Voltaire and Pieta, is going to be the moderator and framer of the issue. And then uh, representing the foreign investors is going to be myself and Marcus Bergstaller from Hogan Lovells. Uh, representing the respondent state is going to be uh, Luis Gonzalez Garvis and Jeremy Sharp. And then uh, giving sort of a wrap up discussion is Martins Paparinskis from UCL. So that's the lineup that we have today, and then we'll leave time at the end for comments and Q&A as well. And as Roger said, I'm going to give a, a general overview of what seemed shocking a year ago. I think a year on, it seems like somewhat old news. We've been talking about Brexit now for a year rather incessantly. But you will recall that last June, I think it came as a shock to a lot of people. And the vote for Brexit um, put into motion a real avalanche of economic, social, and political potential consequences, and I think that avalanche, as we know, is still rapidly rolling downhill. Um, and it's interesting to see what it might take in its path. And one big concern and sense of uncertainty is what it might mean for foreign investors in the United Kingdom. And surely, the United Kingdom itself, uh, the government, would be concerned and have a sense of uncertainty as well as to what the consequences might be for the UK um, government. Um, and that brings us, of course, to the question today, is whether um, Brexit could open the door for potential suits against the United Kingdom. Um, so the first question we just want to look at as a general overview, I see some familiar faces in the room, but I don't know if everybody um, would find themselves to be part of the international arbitration mafia. Um, those of us who look at investment disputes on a regular basis are probably not um, uh, the norm. There's pl plenty of people who don't do that. I'm, I imagine that when NAFTA started bringing claims to the US, there were a lot of lawyers that suddenly ran out and needed to learn about what this investment law subject was all about. And I suspect that we will be in that now in the UK as well. If there are potential uh, investment claims, you will have a whole new industry of people learning about what these claims mean. So I'm not going to assume that we know investment law um, entirely in the audience, but I'll give a very, very high level overview. Um, but to look at the, the practical implications, what 
uh, Brexit could mean for investors, um, the various categories of effects. The one that we hear the most about in the media is the free movement of people, um, that the migration from the UK or into the UK could slow as a result of Brexit. Um, and immigration from the UK does boost the, the UK or in, into the UK does boost the um, UK economy in the sense that it does uh, support the UK's ability to grow without pushing up wage growth um, and keeping interest rates lower. Um, and in terms of for foreign investment, there may be well a number of investors that would have come to the UK expecting to have a certain um, low wage uh, group of employees that may not have access to this labor market in the future. Um, so the low wage sector may be hit um, following um, Brexit, and that might damage the expectations of some investors who had expected to have that low wage uh, pool supply of labor. Um, but the, the, the categories that might be even more relevant for our conversation today, the first would be the free movement of goods um, to the extent that that would be impacted um, by Brexit. Um, clearly being in the EU single market has made, is one of the reasons the UK has been an attractive um, area for foreign investment. It's a good um, export platform for multinational companies wanting to export goods into the UK because they don't um, have the same tariffs um, and non-tariff barriers that they might have um, exporting into the EU from elsewhere. And uh, trade statistics show that the EU is the destination for about half of all um, export goods produced in the UK. Um, and The Guardian recently calculated that the cost in customs duties for a variety of products, if the UK were to carry on exporting to the EU at the same rate as, they do, as we do today, um, but without a good Brexit deal, could amount to $7.6 billion an annually in new tariffs on goods. And this would be felt by a range of industries. Um, and the other aspect in terms of free movement of goods is to remember that the EU has a number of uh, free trade agreements um, which provide then access, the, the your, uh, British economy has access to about 50 other markets by way of EU FTAs. Um, and it's, it's uncertain, and that would be a whole other subject or conference in and of itself, the extent to which those um, free trade agreements will remain in place. There is some debate about that, um, but we won't go into it. For the time being, the issue really is that there's uncertainty uh, surrounding this. And certainly there will be additional costs um, in terms of tariffs if we get what's called a hard Brexit um, negotiation. Another aspect which will be relevant for our conversations today is the free movement of capital. Um, this is primarily affecting the financial services industries um, and what's known as passporting rights. The uh, financial services at the moment have probably the most to lose of any industry um, because of these passporting rights, which allow workers, or sorry, allow financial service industry uh, participants in the UK, a nearly unlimited range of um, options within the EU. They do not need to get permission to, enter, to sell their financial services into each individual country um, as they had before um, the EU. And so Brexit could potentially impact those passporting rights. Um, and this is actually something that could have a major impact on London as a center for financial services. Uh, potentially. Um, so all of these things, um, it's all unknown, the extent to which we'll have a hard or soft Brexit, the extent to which these um, consequences may impact foreign investors. Um, but nonetheless, there will be some impact, that's quite clear. And the, the question um, is really whether investors will feel that they've been hard done by, um, by these changes, whether they invested in the UK with the understanding that the UK would continue to be part of the European Union, um, and whether their legitimate expectations, um, a term that I'll come on to in a moment, will be dashed by the EU um, and British divorce. Um, so coming on to today's discussion, what we want to situate this um, conversation is in this network of bilateral and multilateral investment treaties of which the UK is part. 
the UK currently has 110 bilateral investment treaties in force, and it's also a member of the Energy Charter Treaty, which is a multilateral um, industry, you know, uh, sector uh, treaty. And these, these treaties promote um, inward investment from foreign businesses by offsetting some of the risks so commonly associated with foreign investment in, in foreign countries. Um, so if you take the example um, of, say, the bilateral investment treaty with China that the UK uh, with, has, um, at the moment, China has um, inward investment of over 38 billion since 2005. Um, and so if those investors felt aggrieved, there's quite a significant pool of um, investment capital to, at play. Um, similarly, India has um, a lot of foreign investment in the United Kingdom, could be another potential um, player. The other um, particularly relevant industry in particular, as opposed to country, that could be at risk is the UK's automotive industry. We, of course, have had foreign investment in the UK industry, uh, foreign investment in the UK automotive industry, including Tata Motors buying Jaguar, Land Rover, and so on. Um, and it is likely that Brexit will, um, if there's a hard Brexit, there will be increased tariffs on automobile exports as well as automobile part exports into the EU. So all of this creates uncertainty and concern. Um, and if we look at the past um, investment claims that we have seen against other countries, um, the, the main provision in these bilateral investment treaties that will be, I would imagine, the subject of our, our speakers' um, comments today will be the fair and equitable treatment standard that bilateral investment treaties um, impose on host states. And there's been quite a lot of um, discussion and increased um, findings by arbitral tribunals that the, bilet, that the fair and equitable treatment standard incorporates the need for states to maintain a consistent regulatory and legal framework. And in order to decide um, whether there has been this legitimate expectations established, um, tribunals often look at what's been said to particular investors. They look at express commitments as well as what were the implicit commitments made by the host government when an investor um, arrived in the country. And that will be an interesting analysis. We have one example now of the, um, the, the British government giving what we understand are some promises to one um, company in particular, Nissan, um, when they were concerned about Brexit and threatening to leave, the UK government assured them that they would not suffer as a consequence of Brexit. Uh, we don't know the details of what that commitment was, but it is interesting to think that there could be potentially some of these bilateral or direct um, commitments having been made by the UK government and the consequences of those for investment claims remain to be seen. Um, I'm gonna stop in a minute. I really just wanted to, to remark on the three main uh, areas, and perhaps our speakers will come up with others, but three main um, precedents or, or examples of where countries have been sued for regulatory change. Um, I'm sure many of you will know about the whole host of claims that were brought against Argentina as a result of its 2001 financial crisis. Um, it faced dozens of claims um, in response to changes that it made to tariff guarantees um, and other regulatory changes. And the jurisprudence that came out of those claims um, is, is somewhat mixed, but it really came, can be boiled down to the idea that the greater the alteration of the legal framework, the higher the likelihood a tribunal will find that a host state has violated the fair and equitable treatment standard. Um, and so one questions whether Brexit would rise to the level of a very significant um, change to the regulatory framework um, within the meaning given to it by some of those um, tribunals. Another series of cases that might be of relevance to us today are the 30 odd claims that Spain is currently facing as a result of some of its changes to its regulatory framework in the renewable energy sector. Those claims are being brought under the Energy Charter Treaty to which the UK is a party as I mentioned earlier. Um, and to date we have one win for Spain and one win for claimant. 
Um, and so it will be interesting to see how those um, evolve. The idea, again, is how radically um, does a regulatory framework need to be altered in order to it have um, justified or, or brought um, a successful fair and equitable treatment claim. And finally, another area or another um, source of claims that might be of relevance for Brexit because of the importance of the financial services industry in the UK um, are some of the claims against Cyprus. These were brought by Greek investors who uh, felt that their financial investments were compromised during the bailout, or sorry, the bail-in of Cypriot banks. Um, and those claims involve some at least 600 or so um, individual and institutional depositors and bondholders um, asserting a whole host of claims. And these, again, would be uh, of relevance given the importance of the financial services industry in the UK. So those, to conclude, those cases um, give us a bit of a taste of what we might expect um, in Brexit. And I would now want to hand it over to our distinguished panelists who will give a much more in-depth, I'm sure, um, discussion of these high-level comments that I have just made. And Roger, for the claimant. Thanks very much. Um, I have the pleasure to present arguments on one side of today's debate, um, although I do want to stress uh, that these are not my own personal views, but rather those that Council for Foreign Investors might argue on behalf of their client. Uh, let me begin by reading a quote that might help frame how foreign investors are feeling right now about the prospect of a hard Brexit. Uh, a Brexit in which the common market with the European Union that has existed for decades is about to be abolished and replaced by WTO standards. Uh, with its embrace of a hard Brexit, the United Kingdom is now moving from a world of free trade to one in which British exports will face over $7 billion per year in tariff duties to the European Union. So here's how one commentator described such destabilizing change to the British regulatory environment. Quote, the measure in question beyond any doubt will substantially change the legal and business framework under which investments were decided and implemented. The United Kingdom has constructed a regulatory framework containing specific guarantees to attract foreign capital. Substantial foreign investment was undertaken on the strength of such guarantees, and foreign investors had reasonable grounds to rely on such conditions. Today, however, the guarantees of the tariff regime that had seduced so many foreign investors to this country are being dismantled. Where there was certainty and stability for investors, doubt and ambiguity are the order of the day. Uh, the long-term outlook enabled by the tariff regime has been transformed into a day-to-day -day discussion about what comes next. It is now subject to a protracted renegotiation process that has failed to provide a final and definitive framework for the operation of business. It is clear that the stable legal framework that induced investment into the United Kingdom is no longer in place." Close quote. Okay, um, in truth, that quote was really not about Brexit. Uh, that quote was about the Argentinian financial crisis in the early 2000s. And every time you heard me say the word United Kingdom, the original quote had the word Argentina. That quote was drawn from an investment arbitration case 10 years ago brought by a foreign investor against Argentina, one in which the investor was awarded over $100 million. That claim was one of dozens in which British, American, and other foreign investors have won claims against Argentina for passing laws that abandoned fixed exchange rates and converted dollar-denominated accounts into pesos. But as the quote I read suggests, one could just as easily say that with Brexit, the United Kingdom has caused similar instability for foreign investors. And that's why the quote, as you heard it, sounded so believable. Foreign investors crave stability. And in some cases, they have the right to demand it. Why? Because capital exporting countries like the United Kingdom impose those obligations on capital importing countries like Argentina, and as a matter of reciprocity, accept the same conditions for themselves. International law holds that host states are accountable for, ma for making certain promises to foreign investors and then breaking those promises. Without question, international law gives states the freedom to modify domestic law, but if the changes are too dramatic and too destabilizing, 
International law may require compensation for such tumultuous changes. In signing bilateral investment treaties, the United Kingdom has protected British investors abroad, but also guaranteed foreign investors at home that it will provide a stable framework for investment. Just as British investors have the right to expect a stable regulatory environment when they do business in Argentina, so too do foreign investors have a right to expect fundamental stability in the British regulatory regime. But a hard Brexit threatens that fundamental stability. The question presented today is whether foreign investors have viable claims against the United Kingdom as a result of a hard Brexit. The easiest way to answer that question is to look at the existing jurisprudence and compare the conduct of other countries with that of the United Kingdom. So let's look at a few examples in which uh, states have lost hundreds of millions of dollars as a result of changes to the re regulatory environment. As mentioned before, in Argentina, the state abandoned fixed exchange rates and converted dollar accounts into peso accounts. In Ecuador, the state provided VAT rebates, but then abandoned its VAT regime and prevented foreign investors from seeking VAT reimbursements. In Mexico, in response to political and community pressure, the state acted inconsistently and without full transparency by revoking pre-existing approvals for, invest for infrastructure projects. In Spain, after providing special tariff regimes for solar energy projects, the state eliminated the fixed tariff regime and dramatically reduced its renewable energy subsidies. In Canada, the state approved an offshore wind farm project and then sub subsequently imposed a moratorium on all such projects. In the Czech Republic, the state provided financial assistance to some failing banks, but not to others in a manner that discriminated against foreign investors. So if Argentina and Ecuador and Mexico, Spain, Canada, and the Czech Republic, to mention a few, uh, can violate international law for such conduct, what prevents the United Kingdom from also losing such claims? These obligations are significant, so significant that Ecuador just last month withdrew from a dozen different bits after losing billions in claims. There are two major events that trigger a fair and equitable treatment claim under UK's bilateral investment treaties. First, that the government provides specific assurances to particular investors to induce, induce them to invest and then acts contrary to those assurances. Following the referendum, the United Kingdom has routinely made grandiose assurances that all will be well for investors after the great divorce. The assurance made to Nissan in Sunderland is perhaps the best known example, but Theresa May routinely makes extravagant claims that she wants frictionless, duty-free trade with Europe. In response to such promises, what is an investor to do? I would say that over the next two years, every investor worth his salt should be demanding as a condition of continued investment that the government will provide specific insurances. Then, if the government does not live up to those assurances, the investor has a valid claim against the United Kingdom. Even if only a few foreign investors are able to secure such assurances, the case law suggests that when a government bails out some foreign investors but not others, this may give rise to claims of improper, non-transparent, and discriminatory treatment. Second, international law protects investors from a fundamental change to the regulatory regime that fails to account for the investments made in reliance on the prior regime. With a hard Brexit, the United Kingdom will fundamentally alter its regulatory environment to the detriment of certain foreign investors. Let's take a few examples. Foreign automakers invested in the United Kingdom with the legitimate expectation that they could export their cars to Europe duty-free. After a hard Brexit, they will face 10% duties on every car exported to the European Union. 57% of all British auto exports go to the European Union. And that means that over 500,000 cars will be subject to steep duties that will severely diminish the wafer-thin profit margins of the auto industry. In the energy sector, the British reportedly will scrap their renewable energy targets and remove renewable energy subsidies. After Brexit, we can assume that the European Investment Bank will severely diminish loans to the British energy market and that the European Union will decrease funding energy projects that have a British nexus. 
Such drastic changes to the energy sector could lead foreign investors to sue the British government under the Energy Charter, not unlike what foreign investors have done with Spain when Spain removed subsidies to the solar energy sector. Or take the banking industry. Banks have established themselves in the UK in part to freely conduct business throughout Europe, and over 5,000 UK firms rely on corporate passports to conduct business across the European U Union. Losing full access to the EU single market and financial services will put the UK banking industry at significant risk. If the UK cannot address the fundamental change to the banking regulatory environment by the loss of passporting, foreign investors will argue that they established themselves in the UK with the legitimate expectation that they could access the European market. Again and again, investment arbitration tribunals have found that stability of the legal and business framework of the state is an essential element in the standard of what is fair and equitable treatment under international law. The most prominent arbitrators in the world, arbitrators like Albert Jan Vandenberg, Charles Brower, Camel McLaughlin, Mark Lalonde, Yves Fortier, and Arthur Watts, all recognize this fundamental imperative. Again and again, when host countries do not abide by that obligation, they have been forced to pay foreign investors. The question is not whether there will be drastic changes following Brexit. In a recent KPMG poll, over half of top CEOs believe that UK's ability to do business will be hindered after leaving the European Union. And over three-fourths of UK CEOs are considering some sort of relocation out of the United Kingdom. Even the name, the Great Repeal Act, underscores the drama of the day. If the government was really smart, they would have called it the great but totally routine business as usual repeal bill. Um, so drastic changes, I think, are a given. We all know that. The real question is whether those changes will be so dramatic that they will give rise to valid legal claims. Permanently eliminating European subsidies, dramatically raising tariffs between countries within the common market, abruptly creating immigration barriers for millions of high-skilled Europeans, and foreclosing access to certain European markets. These are the kinds of things that a hard Brexit will, would risk and the kinds of things that could alter the stability of the legal and business framework of the United Kingdom. So in anticipating what the other side will argue, I want to stress that this is not about sovereign autonomy or freedom. The government has the right to enact, modify, or cancel any law that it chooses. But some sovereign acts, like expropriation of property or the violation of fair and equitable treatment, require compensation to injured parties. Under international investment law, there's a line that governments cannot cross without financial consequences. And if Brexit is mishandled, the British government risks crossing that line. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I shall also start by saying that uh, what I'm going to say is not a personal view, it's not the firm, uh, um, the, the view of my, of my firm either. Um, it is right to say that for foreign investors to sue the UK for Brexit, they need to be able to rely on an investment treaty. Recent UK government statistics suggest that the top 10 countries of origin of foreign investment in the UK were United States, Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, UK offshore islands, Germany, Spain, Switzerland, Japan, and Belgium. Those familiar with the UK's BITs will have spotted that none of those countries have a BIT in force with the United Kingdom. Hong Kong, which uh, is uh, number 13 on that list, and Singapore, which is number 16, are those countries that rank highest for origin of foreign investment in the UK that have a BIT in force with the United Kingdom. There are other countries that have uh, a very narrow dispute resolution clause in place, um, which may also be uh, difficult to be relied upon. So at first sight, it would therefore seem that the United Kingdom does not have too much to fear when it comes to claims before investment for investors as a result of Brexit. However, this picture is incomplete without having regard to the Energy Charter Treaty. As is well known and has been mentioned before, the UK is also a contracting party to the ECT. I've also looked at the countries with the highest in total investment in the UK energy market. This list reads as follows. Spain, Denmark, Germany, 
Norway, Ireland, France, China, United States, Netherlands, and Japan. Now, those familiar with the contracting parties to the ECT will have spotted that, save for China and the United States, all of those countries are contracting parties to the ECT. Equally, most of these countries are EU member states. It is well known that the question of whether tribunals in intra-EU cases have jurisdiction remains to be decided. However, it would seem obvious that, for the purposes of claims by these EU investors in the UK, this question is smooth simply because after Brexit, the UK will not be an EU member state. So certainly in the energy sector, but also to the extent that investors are able to rely on a BIT in other sectors, there would therefore seem to be a legal basis for claims before investors against the UK for Brexit. The ECT and UK BITs typically include an obligation to accord fair and equitable treatment to foreign investors. Among others, these clauses protect foreign investors' legitimate expectations at the time these investments were made. Now, one expectation that foreign investors in the UK, at least until recently, had was that they would be able to enjoy free movement of goods, services, capital, and people within the EU. Foreign investors in the UK could not have reasonably foreseen that the UK would decide to cease uh, to be an EU member state. As a result of the withdrawal from the EU, the UK violated its obligations under the Fair and Equal Treatment Clauses included in relevant investment treaties by frustrating foreign investors' legitimate expectations. Therefore, the UK is liable for any losses incurred by foreign investors that were caused by that decision. Now, this becomes fairly obvious uh, when one looks at recent international arbitral practice. Uh, there was already mentioned a uh, reference to the cases against Spain. And as you uh, may have uh, uh, heard, there was a, the first case against Spain that was decided in favor of the investors in a, a decision by an ICSID tribunal in a case ISA against Spain of, of, of 4 May, uh, less than four weeks ago, the tribunal held uh, that, quote, the tribunal finds that respondents' obligation under the ECT to afford investors fair and equitable treatment does protect investors from a fundamental change to the regime in a manner that does not take account of the circumstances made in reliance on the prior regime. And the tribunal in the same case also holds that, quote, taking account of the context and of the ECT's object and purpose, the tribunal concludes that Article 10.1's obligation to accord fair and equitable treatment necessarily embraces an obligation to provide fundamental stability in the central characteristics of the legal regime relied upon by investors in making long-term investments. If certain amendments to the regulatory framework for renewable energy in Spain amount to a violation of the fair and equitable treatment obligation in an investment treaty, how could withdrawal from the EU after 40 years of EU membership not amount to such a violation, especially as no member state has ever withdrawn from the EU to date? In particular, where a foreign investor relied on specific undertakings by the UK government towards them, whereby the UK government represented to the investor in an agreement or otherwise that, is, that it is and will remain an EU member state, then these representations constituted a basis of a foreign investor's legitimate expectations. One example that has already been mentioned before as well was uh, in late 2016 when the UK government made assurances regarding the outcome of the UK's withdrawal from the EU to Nissan. A Japanese car maker producing 500,000 cars per year in its British plant. Prime Minister Theresa May met with uh, Nissan's chief executive who reported uh, to have said that, quote, the government gave us assurances that it was the government's intention that they would have a competitive trading environment at the end of the process, which Nissan understood to isolate Nissan's business from any adverse effects of Brexit. 
The argument that the UK violated its international legal obligations in case a foreign investor can rely on the fair and equitable treatment obligation in an investment treaty is only strengthened by the fact that the UK is a highly developed country. Investors could have reasonably expected a high level of predictability and certainty in the United Kingdom. In other words, investors did not and could not anticipate the risk of a fundamental change in the UK's legal environment. Now, although there are many areas where the UK's legal environment will be vitally altered as a result of Brexit, there are two particular ones with the, where the UK's withdrawal from the EU will make waves. Probably these are trading goods and provision of financial services. First, foreign investors establish themselves in the UK with a view to manufacture goods here and trade them in the European Union. Given that the EU accounts for half of the UK's trade and over 40% of value added in UK exports, there is a number of foreign investors that would be adversely impacted, including in such sectors as automotive, for example, Tata, Nissan or Toyota, and train manufacturing, for example, Hitachi. About 50% of vehicles assembled in the United Kingdom are exported to the EU. Therefore, any introduction of custom duties or quantitative restrictions on goods exported to the EU will increase operating costs and lead to a decline in profits. Any such change results in a fundamental change in the legal environment and the UK will be liable for it under applicable investment treaties. Secondly, another sector that will get ready for investment claims against the UK is the financial services sector. Trading services represents about 40% of UK uh, total exports and 23% of UK imports, while other statistics show that London has a share of about 50% in certain segments of the global financial markets. Financial institutions, including banks and insurers, established their subsidiaries in the UK with a view to provide financial services in the European Union. Losing passporting rights, enabling them to do so, means that they have viable investment claims against the UK for Brexit. In conclusion, foreign investors in the UK had legitimate expectations that the UK will remain a member state of the European Union. The UK's withdrawal from the EU results in a fundamental change to the UK's regulatory framework. This constitutes a violation of the UK's international legal obligations contained in investment treaties, in particular the fair and equitable treatment standard. Given the number and significance of affected foreign investors, the damages which the UK will have to pay to foreign investors will be substantial. The public in other EU member states is already aware of these claims. Last week, a journalist of one of the major German daily newspapers interviewed me. The only purpose of the interview was to discuss whether foreign investors can sue the UK for Brexit. I do not know whether the UK government is aware of this addition to the Brexit bill. It will be huge. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. It's a pleasure to be here and with Luis to represent the possible perspectives of the UK government and not necessarily our own. The fact that we're having this debate under such a cloud of uncertainty suggests that investors in the UK do not have a very complete understanding of their rights under UK bilateral investment treaties and that the UK government does not have a very complete understanding of its potential liability under these agreements. So let me just briefly touch on four main reasons for this uncertainty, aside from the general uncertainty surrounding Brexit itself. First, many bid obligations are simply indeterminate. Fair and equitable treatment, full protection and security, measures equivalent to expropriation, these terms do not readily lend themselves to clear application. Second, the rules for interpreting these terms themselves provide limited guidance. Under international law, a treaty has to be interpreted in good faith. 
in accordance with the ordinary meaning of the terms in context in light of the treaty's object and purpose. But these rules are not very useful often in the context of international investment arbitration. Terms such as fair and equitable treatment have no ordinary meaning internationally. And tribunals tend to use context and object and purpose in a circular fashion, merely to confirm that the treaty terms should be interpreted to protect foreign investment. Third, government officials generally act with an awareness of domestic legal obligations. But many bit provisions do not contain ready parallels to domestic law obligations. There often are no good domestic analogs for obligations like fair and equitable treatment, full protection and security, or indirect expropriation. And so government officials generally do not carry out their ordinary day-to-day -day activities with these international obligations in mind. They may, for example, give foreign investors certain assurances that inadvertently have implications in bid arbitrations. And even if government officials have the foresight to seek legal advice, government lawyers may not be able to give clear guidance. Finally, a foreign investor typically can structure its investment to obtain bid protections regardless of where the investor is based. So for example, there's no US-UK bilateral investment treaty, but a US investor could incorporate in say Hong Kong and then sue the UK under the Hong Kong-UK bid. So the UK government may not even know that a US investor could bring a bid claim until it's already been filed. The UK government thus has no idea how many foreign companies in the UK are eligible to bring bid claims. The government has to assume that any foreign investor in the UK could previously have structured itself to take advantage of one of the more than 90 bids that are enforced for the UK. These claims are not brought to English courts, as we heard, but to international arbitral tribunals. The governing law is not English law, but international law. And unlike in trade cases, the remedies typically sought in bid cases are money damages. And claimants have sought hundreds of millions of dollars or even billions of dollars in these bid claims. So there's no way to stop these claims from being brought post-Brexit under UK bilateral investment treaties but they should not succeed. It's not always easy to define precisely what these bit do require of states, but tribunals have given useful guidance to what they do not require. So let me touch on four important limitations. First, a bit does not prevent a state from changing its legal and economic framework. A bit cannot be treated like a comprehensive stabilization clause in a foreign investment contract. As the tribunal observed in the Imprigilo v. Argentina case, fair and equitable treatment cannot be designed to ensure the immutability of the legal order, the economic world, and the social universe, and play the role assumed by stabilization clauses specifically granted to foreign investors with whom the state has signed investment agreements. It is each state's undeniable right and privilege to exercise its sovereign legislative power. The state has the right to enact, modify, and cancel a law at its own discretion. Save for the existence of an agreement in the form of a stabilization clause or otherwise, there is nothing objectionable about an amendment brought to the regulatory framework existing at the time an investor made its investment. Second, investors must accept that dramatic, dra drastic changes in circumstances may lead to drastic changes in law. As the tribunal observed in the ECE project management versus Czech Republic case, if the circumstances change completely, any reasonable investor should expect that the law would dramatically change. It is reasonable to foresee that a small change in circumstances might entail minor changes in the law, while a complete change might entail major changes in the law. This has been understood by the Iran-US Claims Tribunal in Starit. Investors in Iran, like investors in all other countries, have to assume a risk that the country might experience strikes, lockouts, disturbances, changes of the economic and political system, and even revolution. 
that any of these risks materialize does not mean that property rights affected by such events can be deemed to have been taken. Third, a bid is not an insurance policy to protect investors even from drastic changes in domestic law and the economic framework. The tribunal in EDF versus Romania remarked, except where specific promises or representations are made by the state to the investor, the latter may not rely on a bilateral investment treaty as a kind of insurance policy against the risk of any changes in the host state's legal and economic framework. Finally, an investor cannot claim bit protections merely because government or the voting public were ill-informed or misguided. As the tribunal observed in the Pashak versus Mongolia case, the fact that a democratically elected legislature has passed legislation that may be considered as ill-conceived, counterproductive, and excessively burdensome does not automatically allow one to conclude that a breach of an investment treaty has occurred. If such were the case, any number of investment claims would increase by a very large number. Legislative assemblies around the world spend a good part of their time amending substantive proportions of existing laws in order to adjust them to changing times. A claim for a breach under an investment treaty has to be proven by claimants under the specific rules established in that treaty. So here, the UK's elected legislature is responding to domestic political and legal processes, including a popular referendum. That is an accepted part of the democratic process in the United Kingdom. It is the environment in which all investors in the UK made their investments. Those investors must have assumed that the UK could withdraw its membership from the EU. Withdrawal from the EU is expressly contemplated in the Treaty on European Union. The UK is exercising its sovereign right to leave the EU in accordance with the express terms of Article 50 of the Treaty. The UK's departure may have financial consequences for everyone in the UK, foreign investors, domestic investors alike. It would be patently unreasonable to conclude that UK bits afford foreign investors a special entitlement to claim compensation arising from a non-discriminatory measure of general application affecting the whole of the country and its people. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I will address, I uh, will first address the uh, objections to the jurisdiction, issues of jurisdiction and admissibility, and then I will address substantive issues. I have identified 25 jurisdictional and admissibility issues <laughs> for any claim that an investor may bring against the UK for Brexit, but uh, conscious of time, I'm just going to address five. Um, number one, as we all know, the right to submit a claim uh, requires the fulfillment of certain conditions. Some of these conditions that always apply to any BIT uh, are one, that there must exist a measure. Two, that the measure affecting the investment must be attributable to the state, to the host state. Third, that the measure must specifically relate to the, investor, uh, to the investment or to the investor. So, first objection. We have, we have heard from uh, my, my dear friends from the, representing the, the, the investors' side. And we haven't been able to identify, they haven't been able to identify the measure. What is the disputed measure that we are talking about here, or about Brexit? Is it the decision to exit the EU? Is it the decision not to pursue the EEA model or to remain in the customs union? Now, how can any of these policies qualify as a measure? Now, we know that a measure must be a law, regulation, an administrative uh, practice, or a requirement. It doesn't apply. Now, is it the failure of the UK and the EU to reach a comprehensive trade deal? 
Is that the measure that is in dispute in an investment treaty claim against the UK? Well, no, because the UK, it cannot be attributable, attributable to the UK a failure to reach an agreement with the EU. Second objection is, well, the second objection is, and it was mentioned by Susan, uh, the fact that they're going, to be, they're going to impose tariffs, we're going to have tariffs, and, and we're going to have trade barriers, and it's going to cost. We're going to have trade costs. But if the claim is about the imposition of, let's say, customs duties, rules of origin, anti-dumping duties, or their non-tariffs trade barriers, the question is whether this qualifies as an investment or a trade dispute. Are we talking about trade disputes or investment disputes when we talk about an issue of import-export uh, issue? This cannot be an investment dispute, the raising of tariffs or customs duties in, in, in the border. The next objection is, um, is the restructuring of investments. And it was mentioned that in, uh, you, you are very clever and, and very creative lawyers. You're probably advising investments to restructure it in order to be able to be covered by a BIT. Well, there, there might be an issue that investors, restructure, who, uh, investors restructuring their investments in anticipation of Brexit in order to benefit from the protection of a BIT, then the claim will surely be dismissed. And a good example is the Philip Morris versus Australia. It has always been, has also been mentioned about passporting rights that we're gonna, the UK uh, investors are gonna lose the right, the passporting rights in the EU, but um, the UK will object to this on the basis that passporting rights or market share in the European market are not assets under the definition of investment in the BITs. You cannot sold, you cannot sell, you cannot dispose a passporting right, and therefore cannot qualify as investments under BITs. Now on the substantive issues, as a general point, the UK has the sovereign right, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, it has the sovereign right to unilateral unilaterally withdraw from the EU treaties and consequently leave the EU single market. The UK is not even required to justify its exit from the EU, for example, under public interest grounds. Further, the UK has no obligation to even conclude a withdrawal agreement, let alone a new trade agreement with the EU. And upon leaving the EU, the UK would have, to, would have the discretionary power to establish its own MFN tariffs at any level it wishes to. So it is difficult to see how the exercise of the UK's rights to leave the EU and under international law, under EU law, and under WTO law can constitute a breach of a BIT. I will address the substantive, uh, specific substantive issues. And, and, and the first one is expropriation. Now, my colleagues did not mention expropriation at all. They simply gave away uh, the, the, the possibility that there can be an expropriation claim, and it's because there cannot be any expropriation, any valid expropriation claim against the UK uh, for Brexit. Why? Because foreign investors may be disappointed by a no-deal scenario and might find it difficult, if not impossible, to continue operating their businesses in a UK post-Brexit world. The situation, as tragic and disappointing as it may be, is not something BITs can protect investors from. Paraphrasing the Athenian Tribunal, it is a fact of life in every country that a domestic or foreign investor may be disappointed by the policies of governments everywhere, but investment treaties are not intended to provide investors with a blanket protection from this type of disappointment. This was echoed by the Feldman Tribunal, stated, not all government regulatory activity that makes it difficult or impossible for an investor to carry out a particular business, change in the law or change in the application of existing laws that makes it uneconomical to continue business is an expropriation claim. 
is an expropriation under the treaty. In the Feldman case, the investor was effectively precluded from exporting cigarettes. The Feldman Tribunal found that the investor nevertheless could pursue other continuing lines of business activity. The expropriation claim was dismissed. So even if Brexit makes, it, makes certain businesses less profitable or even economical to continue, uneconomical to continue, this in itself would not be sufficient to find a breach of the expropriation uh, clause. The key of an expropriation claim is whether an investor still had control of its investment after Brexit and whether the enjoyment of the property had been effectively neutralized. This is a CMS versus Argentina case. But even if the enjoyment of the property after Brexit had been neutralized, there's no valid expropriation claim because no deal scenario, and I'm not going to call it hard Brexit because I don't know what that means, uh, a no deal scenario would at most be a temporary loss of a benefit opportunity, namely the investor's inability to compete in the European market for a short period of time, given that it is almost certain that shortly after Brexit, the UK will conclude a bold and ambitious FDA with the EU. So there's no permanent, substantially complete deprivation of the economic use of an investment, which is an essential condition for an expropriation claim to succeed. Now, for an equitable treatment. For foreign investor would argue that, and has been um, uh, forcefully um, argued by my colleagues, that they made their investments in the expectation that the UK would maintain a stable and predictable uh, environment in which they could operate their investments. But this environment requires unrestricted, this environment re requires unrestricted access to the EU single market. But the guarantees to operate within the EU single market are not to be implied, so as to the doctrine of legitimate expectations is not to be used to rewrite contracts, rewrite treaties, or to be transformed into stabilization clauses, as Jeremy uh, mentioned. It is certainly not sufficient to refer to the su subjective expectations the investors might have had when, it invested, when they made their investments. The current trend in, 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 in investment treaty jurisprudence is that the expectations should be based on specific legal commitments made to the investor by the state when it decided to make the investment. The Enron Tribunal stated it was essential that these expectations derive from the conditions that were offered by the state. But these expectations must be reasonable and must be in a legal document, a contract, an investment contract, for example. But it is, it is unreasonable to expect that uh, you can benefit from the EU market and ignore Article 50. Article 50 provides that any member state can withdraw from the treaty. So it cannot be reasonable that an investor expected to receive the benefits and completely ignore the possibility that Article 50 could be triggered. Discrimination. As Jeremy mentioned uh, earlier, Brexit is a non-discriminatory measure of general application. It applies equally to all citizens, businesses and industries, whether domestic or foreign. So there cannot be, there can't be a, a, a discrimination claim for Brexit. To conclude, to say that in, uh, investor, an investor has legitimate, ex legitimate claims against the UK for Brexit is simply absurd. If that would be true, then any BIT signatory would potentially be subject to a massive number of treaty claims for damages every time a state amends or terminates an FDA. If that would have been the case, we would be, we, many countries would be floated with investment claims, and that can surely not be the intention of the parties when they sign BITs. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Suzanne, for giving me the easiest task, uh, wrapping up and summarizing the remarks of these four very fine speakers. 
think probably the only advantage I have over them that I can say that these will, buy, will be my own views, albeit as you will see they'll be quite uh, fuzzy, so perhaps not much of a benefit there. I think it would probably be most helpful to zero in on what is peculiar about this situation. So I will just focus on things that are peculiar to possible Brexit claims. Obviously, there are issues that would be relevant for any investment arbitration claim, like Jeremy and Lewis outlined very well the issues relating to treaty shopping, but I will leave those aside. I think it may be helpful to structure the legal perspective in two parts. In a boring, lawyerly manner, I think we would probably most agree that under international law, there are two necessary criteria for state responsibility to arise, including for state responsibility investment law. Attribution of conduct to a state and breach of an international obligation by that state. And Again, in an utterly boring manner, these are the two points that I will talk about. So the first question, the, the, the issue that Louis touched upon, is their conduct that is attributable to the state. I must say that I felt, I felt less concerned about the point that Louis made, that failure to do something might not be attributable. I think that international law is quite open to the idea of attributing omissions. What strikes me as more interesting is the fact that there are a number of international actors in play, something that is possibly quite unique for investment claims. As we know, the whole reciprocal structure usually means that there is just one state accused of certain naughtiness. Now, of course, if we pull back a little bit, under international law more generally, it is not unusual for claims of responsibility to be launched against multiple actors. And if we think about investment law, probably the closest that we can get is Eurotunnel. The case where Eurotunnel brought claims against United Kingdom and France. And if we think about that case, I think it gives us perhaps a little bit of a sense of complexities, both in terms of applicable rules and remedies, but also attribution if only one of a number of international actors who are accused of having engaged in certain naughtiness regarding individual actors is falling under a particular jurisdiction. Uh, there is, of course, the possibility of energy charter treaty claims, uh, noted by Suzanne, which would resolve some of these issues. Uh, energy charter treaty claims may be launched against the United Kingdom, other member states, as well as, of course, European Union itself. Uh, also another actor under international law capable of bearing responsibility. Uh, if we look at possible interplays of these claims, because here we are, might probably be thinking, depending on whether one sort of thinking is about financial resources or auto industry or tariffs and trade, there may be points that result directly from United Kingdom's choices, but there may also be shared responsibility matters. And without boring you about questions of international responsibility, I can just very briefly summarize by saying that this is a fairly complicated point. Uh, not, uh, or rather the other way around, I think that reasonable people may disagree on what are the rules of responsibility that are applicable under international law to responsibility of European Union. I think the closest that investment tribunals have got it was in Electrobel, and it was odd enough to provide some caution regarding clarity of legal rules on the matter. So there's a whole host of incredibly complicated questions of general international law lurking in the background for such cases of shared responsibility. So that, I think, goes to the question of attribution. There are interesting questions when shared conduct and shared responsibility is discussed in international law, and investment law has zero experience in these matters. The other part is the breach of an international obligation. I think that Louise is spot on 
in asking the question of whether many of these matters fall under the definition of the investment, whether they are protected objects at all. And that is the first question. I think, if, again, if we pull back a little bit, international law usually deals with these matters in two ways. One way is drawing line around certain creatures of domestic law that international law protects. And I think that that is probably the way how most people think about investment law. Or the other way to do it like human rights law does, providing an imperfectly overlapping standard that partly draws upon domestic law, but not entirely. And I think there are some cases which may be suggestive of the latter side as well. I just uh, randomly Googling through the um, cases, Pope and Talbot, for example, if we look at back at the very origins of investment arbitration, had a remark of uh, describing access to the US market as a property interest. Now, it's probably not something that many investment tribunals would say nowadays, but there is authority, I think, also for that proposition. Right, so let's assume that rights of whatever character do fall under the broader obligation. Is state acting in compliance with these obligations? And here we are, I think as a number of speakers noted, in a somewhat tricky situation because we do not have a great deal of guidance. And the guidance that we have is almost entirely worthless. Uh, and I'm here thinking in particular about the Argentinian cases, sort of the pedigree that is brought by United States investors. I think that many of you will be familiar uh, with the uh, interpretive complexities there. And when all is said and done, I think, as much as we all enjoyed uh, following uh, all the United States investors' claims uh, for a better half of a decade, they were all riddled with so many basic interpretive errors that everything that has been said in CMS, Enron, and their progeny can be safely taken out of consideration. So that the thing that could have been most helpful was just done so badly that it is not helpful at all. So how might we look at these matters? And here I'm just trying to summarize at the greatest degree of abstraction three ways how I think we might sum up how tribunals might look at it. So one way, the one what Roger suggests, I suppose, is the affortori way. If you change a little bit, you are a little bit likely to be in breach. If you change a lot, you are quite likely, if you exit the European Union, you are virtually certain. So that would be one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it, I suppose, is looking less at the big picture and more at the micro application. And I'm quite attracted by the way how the Hochtief, an Argentina tribunal, looked at these matters, appreciating that things change and then one should not a, a, a approach state's obligation in a dogmatic manner, but it is important to consider whether the state adopted a flexible attitude, whether it tried to renegotiate, whether it tried to search for alternative solutions. So all questions about application, all questions that are very hard to predict and decide in either of the manners that were so skillfully presented. It is not black and white, much turns on application. And I thought that also another possible way of looking at it is the point of, I suppose, a quote within a quote, in some delightfully Umberto-esque manner buried in Jeremy's speech, was starred housing. And so the question is perhaps that the best analogy of the United Kingdom is not Argentina, Spain, or Cyprus, but the revolutionary Iran. The sense that if it, if it is a ground norm that changes, not merely some things at the margins. In those cases, investors have to move on along with everybody else. They are not staying behind in an abstract world where revolution and Brexit did not happen. So these, I think, are three plausible ways of looking at the matter. Let me now wrap up with four scattered remarks that didn't really fall under either of those. So they fall under this point because they are nothing else. 
The first thing to consider is the possible relevance of the consensus of international actors. That these may be things that United Kingdom is doing, not because it is a slow week in May, but because it reflects a consensus with other international actors, European Union, member states, perhaps buttressed by other international organizations. It seems to me that tribunals are increasingly, in various guises, uh, quite receptive to the idea that, to the extent that there are a number of international actors behind a certain measure, it is more likely not to be arbitrary, unfair, capricious, and so on. So that, I think, is in whatever legal way one captures that proposition, that is something to keep in mind. Second point is that we have been talking about um, arbitration, but of course, I think as uh, Robert Volterra once uh, remarked uh, quite astutely, of course, investor state dispute settlement, dispute settlement, as international lawyers know, is not just arbitration and judicial settlement. 99% of dispute settlement is negotiations. And the most important thing about arbitration in such cases is not that it will be resorted to, but that it provides the shadow of law against which uh, government acts and against which negotiations will be taking place. So potentially, even if zero arbitration claims are launched, the background influence on decision-making of policymakers and individual officials will be there. Simply the availability of a particular institution to structure and enforce justiciable claims will do that. A footnote to that, if we think about negotiations, is to appreciate the role that a sophisticated actor like United Kingdom, no doubt, is, will be able to play there. And I think that a smart state in these circumstances, when it provides certain guarantees, will also think about the extent to which investors have to give something up. To the extent that they have access to investment arbitration, they may be asked to give it up, or at least to some extent qualify. Now, you may know that these are one of the grand questions of investment law. To what extent can investors' consent operate to preclude a claim? And in some of the old cases, the great minds were skeptical about it. I think that the more recent approach in cases like Hochtief and uh, MSN, MNSS are supportive of that idea. So one would expect, I think that these are things that would appear in the individual negotiations. A bargaining tool, an important bargaining tool at that. And the final point, if we pull out of investor state dispute settlement, there is, of course, also the interstate aspect. Uh, it is often suggested that in these cases about grand macro events, investor state dispute settlement is not very helpful because it fails to provide the public perspective. It fails to provide the consistency. And of course, uh, we know of some examples like Japan, for example, that has expressed its public disapproval of certain United Kingdom's measures. Now, it happens. Uh, both United Kingdom and Japan are great supporters of the international rule of law. They are both uh, recognize, they have both recognized the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice in a way that prima facie seems to be provide an open route for Japan's claim, multi-billion, whatever it may be, regarding treatment of uh, Japanese investors. So I think United Kingdom is to be commended that it has not uh, changed its uh, declaration when it uh, did in this February. I think it probably remains to be seen uh, whether uh, the commitment to rule of law and openness to multi-billion claims on the interstate fora will remain. But as I said, these are just scattered remarks and don't read anything else in them. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. I uh, had no doubt that you would all have much to say and we were proved correct. Now, I am directed to run a poll here of all of you. Roger's going to help me. I have um, while we have a QA, and a yep. in order to vote whether you think that foreign investors 
can sue the UK. I think, take it by that we mean a viable, viable. claim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you think yes um, or no, could you please vote? And in order to do so, you go on your phone, you can go to the website of the one here, pollev.com backslash Brexit, or you can text. And I tested the texting and it works just fine. So I'm going to hide the results. Nope. Oh no, I'm nope. not hiding the results. Now I'm hiding <laughs> the results. Okay, so it's fine. The way we have it. Yep. Good. Okay. And when we are done with the Q and A, we'll we'll see. However, I don't want that to distract you all from the conversation. Um, if I will like to give the floor to all of you, we have a microphone to go around. If anyone wants to have um, a question, uh, unlike our speakers, your uh, allowed to state your own views, or you can disclaim your, your comment as well. It's up to you. If you could tell us Thank your you. affiliation yeah. and name. Um, Emma Vidagojkovic, Omnia Strategy, LP. Um, I have two questions. One is for Roger and Marcus, and the other one is actually for either Louise or Marcus, whoever feels more comfortable answering. So the first one is, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you have analyzed some of the BITs, maybe all of them, that um, the UK has. I'm wondering, is there a single one that would have a stabilization clause and whether we can um, skillfully use MFN to get that one? Um, it would just be, I think, a, a more uh, fun acclaim to use that than the FET. It will be a bit more, I think, um, direct. So that's a question for you. And the other one is about the responsibility of any connected um, actors. Um, so you mentioned that you know, it will be a possibility to consider how much they have contributed to the results. And I'm just wondering how much does that actually affect the UK's responsibility? Because in my view, the very fact that the UK exposed itself to be at mercy of other actors would in itself be a breach, conditional, of course, upon any harm resulting from it for the investors. Um, and if we consider that other actors' actions or the way the UK thought about them at the time of triggering Article 50, would that mean we are introducing an element of some weird intent, negligence, to the breach of obligations? Uh, because as I understood it, international law was quite clear that that hardly matters. Thanks. So I have to say that I don't know the answer to that question. I, I don't know if there would be a stabilization clause that could be used to sort of get an MFN provision. So you said you've also looked at some. I, I, I looked at it as well to some extent. Maybe I looked at a few BITs of the UK. I haven't seen any uh, with, with a stabilization clause. In my experience, it would be not very likely that there would be any, but I, I don't know for all the UK BITs, and I stand corrected by anyone uh, who knows better than me. Right. Um, that is a good question. I think um, off the cuff, I think that there are two points here. The first is, and I think that that probably very much goes to the way how the claim is framed, but there is the, uh, I think that that is probably European Union's formal uh, position on issues of state responsibility, that to the extent that anybody acts within the sphere of European Union law, within the competence of European Union, under international law, that responsibility accrues exclusively to the European Union. So even if it is something that a state does, member state does an implementation of something Europeanish, uh, under international law it is solely European point. Now, as we will appreciate, it strikes somewhat it's not exactly in line with international law's position. International law's position will tell us that it matters who does it rather than why they do it. But that is something that, uh, as I said, Electrobel, in my view, somewhat oddly accepted and things that Hungary did because it had to do them under, under European law were attributed exclusively to European Commission or rather because European Union was not a party in that case, it was not attributed to Hungary. So it may be that it's, a, from an international dispute settlement perspective, a perfectly valid point to make that to the extent that it's attributable to somebody else, claim fails, uh, because we haven't ticked one of two boxes. To the extent that conduct is intertwined with the conduct of the international actor, 
Probably in international dispute settlement, one would raise a question whether it is proper in terms of admissibility for the tribunal to consider the case. Monetary gold would probably be the ICJ case that one would not do, and it has been sort of popped up once or twice in Chevron and Ecuador and Pingan and Belgium. My sense is that academics are more excited about it than practitioners, but uh, the shared responsibility aspect is really, really utterly uncovered. So that is why it's hard to say sort of where it would be likely land. Perhaps it's utterly irrelevant. Perhaps it is will dispose of everything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saul. Very interesting. I'm Michael Pugh from South Bank University. So a small question for Luis. In your, in your talk, you were saying that uh, there hasn't been a measure yet. And I think we all know that there's been a huge amount of saber rattling but uh, you're quite right that no measure has, has taken place and companies based in the UK are still able to trade and exchange people and capital with the EU because we're still very much part of the EU. But uh, I think we all understand that at some stage there will be the, the so-called Great Repeal Bill. Um, if and when that's passed, would that satisfy your concerns about there not being a measure on which to pin a claim? Yes and no. Uh, yes, it would be a measure. The Great Repeal Act would constitute a measure. Um, there might uh, be another objection from, from the United Kingdom because one of the uh, elements, one of the conditions is that there must be a sufficient significant link between the measure and the investment or the investor. And uh, as Jeremy mentioned, the, the Great Repeal Act would constitute a non-discriminatory uh, measure of general application. And therefore, if it's, not directly, uh, if it's not directed to a specific investment or an investor, then the UK may raise the objection that there's no sufficient li link, there's no nexus, uh, sufficient nexus between the measure and the investment. I think, I think uh, can I respond to that also? I think that there will be instances of a very specific measure that will happen. For example, right now, the UK has committed itself to a certain level of subsidies to promote renewable energies, right, under their 2020 renewable energy target. When they withdraw those subsidies and when they withdraw that specific domestic law, and EU will no longer be relevant to preclude them from doing that, the decision to remove those subsidies is going to give rise to a specific measure that energy companies can rely upon to bring claims against the United Kingdom. Thank you. Could I just ask a follow-up question, please, to Jeremy, which was about, um, Jeremy, you were talking about Article 50 and um, saying that when investors had entered into investment treaties, they would have known that countries could, that countries could have left the EU because of Article 50. So I think we understand that Article 50 came in in the Treaty of Lisbon. So are you drawing a distinction between investors who invested in Britain before Article 50 was put in the EU, um, into the EU treaties, um, on, on some basis that before that there was no specific article pursuant to which countries could leave the EU, and countries that invested after Article 50 had been incorporated? I think it would be a very difficult position to argue for an investor to say that it made its investment in the UK with the expectation that the UK could not exercise its right to leave the EU. So if the fact that the investor said once uh, Article 50 was entered into the EU regime, then I realized that the EU could leave voluntarily, the question would be, on what basis did you conclude that the UK could not leave the EU before that? And that, I think, would be very difficult. So what legitimate expectation would arise for an investor based on its assumption that the UK would remain and would always remain in the European Union? Can I maybe just add on the Article 50 point? I'm slightly surprised by that argument, I have to say, in a sense that uh, if a claim against Spain succeeds on the basis of a change to renewable energy law in Spain, as a matter of Spanish law, I'm sure Spain can change its Renewable Energy Act. So just because 
uh, there is a possibility to withdraw from the EU does not prevent a claim from succeeding. It's also interesting if you go into the negotiating history of Article 50. This article was introduced into the Lisbon Treaty not really with the view for it to be exercised. The negotiators really made it very clear that they put in a provision, uh, but it was not the agreement among those negotiating the provision that it would ever be exercised. And certainly, at least what I know, it was not included upon, say to say, a suggestion by the United Kingdom, which would also be an argument then to say, oh, the UK could rely upon that. So I, I think I'm slightly puzzled by the Article 50 argument in the sense that, oh, there was a right of the UK to exercise that right under Article 50. Thanks, uh, Kira Murphy from Devoys and Plimpton. Just to push that same argument a bit further, assuming that the um, measure hasn't yet occurred and it and has yet to uh, materialise, what legitimate expectation does any investor who invested in the United Kingdom at any point after David Cameron announced that there was going to be a referendum, what legitimate expectation does that investor have that the regulatory situation is going to remain the same? There is case law and jurisprudence and scholarly articles about when does the legitimate expectation arise, and I think it's accurate to say it's traditionally understood to be at the time of the investment, right? So it's arguable that individuals who have invested, corporations have invested prior to the referendum or prior to the Article 50 are going to probably have a stronger legitimate expectation argument than those that came in afterwards, probably. But as I said in my presentation, it would behoove investors now to get specific assurances and then rely on those assurances uh, to bring an investment arbitration claim. A specific question for Luis and the general one. The general one is about how, how much does the answer to this question depends on whether we consider EU law applicable under the BITs or not. Uh, whether EU law is applicable as a fact or as a law or not applicable at all, does it affect the answer to this question of whether investors can, br can bring claims? And the question for Luis is whether uh, you deconstructed all the substantive uh, protections uh, uh, to sustain your position. I'm wondering about denial of justice, whether Brexit... Um, affects the possibility for the investors to bring cases under EU law and even to go before the European Court of Justice and whether denying that right to go to the European Court of Justice could be interpreted as a denial of justice. Would you have an argument maybe to deconstruct also this one? Thank you. Who wants to take that? Uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the general question, um, I think my view is in, in an intra-EU context, EU law is applicable law. Uh, in a non-intra-EU context, EU law is a fact and it's not applicable law. If that makes sense. On, on your question of the of justice. There are so many creative lawyers, and, and when, when someone drafts a, a treaty, we always think, well, we're going to cover this, we're going to cover that. There's always some really uh, creative argument um, that uh, we didn't envisage in the negotiation of investment treaty. Um, I, I don't think that, that would be uh, the case. I don't think uh, you could argue denial of justice on the premises that uh, there is no access to the European Court of Justice. Uh, what the obligation under the Fair and Equitable Treatment Standard is access to justice. So we need to see the Great uh, Repeal Act. At the end of the day is, is whether you're going to have redress. And we, we, there, there's going to be, uh, the white paper made it clear, that there's going to be a res, uh, dispute resolution uh, system mechanism and there are going to be EU law has been transformed into UK law, so you are going to have access to justice. Uh, so in that in that respect, I can see how uh, that could be a breach of your rights to access uh, to justice. 
Maybe I'll take the moderator's prerogative to jump in. Having brought a denial of justice claim under a bilateral investment treaty once, it's not the easiest claim to bring. And it is, of course, one that you have to exhaust domestic remedies, unlike most claims. So it does seem that be a number of hurdles. Yes, Martin. Just perhaps a little bit cheekily jumping on a special <laughs> question that wasn't asked to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there, I think that perhaps two interesting point that cuts seemingly the other way. I mean, I guess sort of going back again to the boring question of attribution, um, uh, states are responsible for conduct in relation to their organs, or in other ways, how we can link to the state. Court of Justice of the European Union is so plainly not the organ of the United Kingdom. So I suppose query was a proposition that the United Kingdom is responsible for it. But I think a somewhat analogous case, and I and much rides on the point on, on, on the word somewhat. Uh, I cannot immediately remember the name of the claimant, but there have been a number of interesting litigations uh, following the dismantlement of the SADC uh, court, um, where an international court um, in which individuals could bring claims against states was perhaps somewhat uh, not entirely elegantly transformed into an interstate uh, court and an investor, tri investor state tribunal found a breach in some elements of there. So, but I think some creative lawyering would be needed there. I think that's, that's absolutely right. I think we could take one more question. Yes. <laughs> My question relates to the assurances given by the British government to NISAP. Um, and I think it's been said that if the British government is in, then in breach of those assurances, that's the foundation of a claim. Um, if the British government fulfills its assurances to Nissan, uh, can other foreign investors then piggyback on the fact that Nissan is getting preferential treatment, um, having, having sought and obtained those assurances and those assurances being fulfilled? I think that's a great question. And I, I think it depends on how one interprets the jurisprudence. But my read of, for example, some of the Czech cases are that the bailout of some financial institutions but not others in a sort of discriminatory, non-transparent way gave rise to a legitimate claim by those other financial in investments. I don't know if others have other thoughts from the Cyprus or other cases about that, but I think that's actually a possibility that we should anticipate some investors wanting to bring a claim for either discrimination or non-transparency or things like that. I don't know if others have a, other thoughts on that. And um, I took an issue with that because I don't think the Nissan situation, uh, the assurances given to Nissan can constitute legitimate expectations. I mean, we, we need to see the document, but um, uh, an assurance or a promise does not constitute uh, in itself a legitimate expectation. It needs to be a commitment, a legal commitment by the state to the investor. Uh, I would take that approach. So given promises or assurance given assurance, well, I cannot give assurance that they would have, that Nissan will have access to the German market. Uh, for example, that would be an unreasonable assurance or expectation. Uh, it can only give assurances as to what the UK can do within its territory. And, and an assurance in itself is not a, a legal commitment. So unless there is a contract there, a legal document, um, given certain commitments, then just the promise of you're going to be okay, we're, do not, we're going to do everything we can, that in itself is not a legitimate expectation. It's also a really important question because um, Japan doesn't have a BIT with the United Kingdom or the, so there's no real basis for Japan to bring a claim, I think, for this. So really you are asking whether Malaysia which owns, a Malaysian company which owns Jaguar, I think, and an Indian company which owns Land Rover can bring those ki kinds of claims that they're not giving similar assurances because the assurances alone will not give rise to a bit because there's no Japanese UK bit. 
If I could just add one word on legitimate assurances, I think it's extraordinary to think about how important this has become in international law. Whereas in international law, a breach of a contract by a state would ordinarily not give rise to state responsibility. Now, a breach of an assurance in something less than a contract can give rise to state responsibility, not through the, necessarily to the text of these agreements, but as they've been interpreted by arbitral tribunals. So this is a remarkable shift in the development of international law and in, in international investment arbitration over the last 15, 20 years. Could I make one point and uh, think both points of caution are certainly to be taken seriously. I think that there has been a tendency of being uh, too too eager to, to swipe up various by-the-way remarks at uh, drinking events as uh, constitute of international obligations. But, I mean, I wonder, um, so I suppose to put it in the international law framework, so what we have here, and again, without knowing the text, so we are really speculating wildly, we have a head of the government of a country making a promise to a particular actor. Now, I think uh, Jeremy is entirely right that it is not a common occurrence, but within the international law four corners, unilateral acts uh, provide an entirely comfortable analogy. Um, they do not occur often. Some people even think that the International Court was not entirely right to say that it had occurred ever. But if states want to do that, um, I think that, that would be pretty much how they would go about doing it. And the fact that this is not um, the rulemaking technology under domestic law, why should we care about that that much is what the French president says at a press conference, the way how French legal system provides for legal obligations to be made. Not a French lawyer, but I very much doubt that. And that, I think, sort of brings us back to the point that um, even though that perhaps in some ways this is more comfortable to think about as an interstate dispute, uh, and that is certainly something where Japan has an open jurisdictional forum to sue the United Kingdom in a very classic international law sense for uh, injury to its national through the usual form of diplomatic protection. I thought that one of the remarks, um, and, and Jeremy in particular, raising the issue of uh, the perception of the UK government to international investment law may shift a little bit, just as the perception of the US um, and I think in Canada shifted once NAFTA started coming home to roost. It would be interesting to see um, the, uh, the UK government's perspective on it in the future, um, even if these claims don't actually go through to arbitration, as we said. The threat of them might be enough. Um, I'm going to show the poll results. Let us see. So we have the yeses. 42% for a potential viable Brexit claim against the UK, and 58% no. So perhaps that's some reassurance <laughs> to the UK government. <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming. I have a feeling this may be the first of various uh, discussions of this particular issue as we go forward. All the other Brexit issues have been covered quite extensively. Um, and we really appreciate you all coming and showing your interest. And I think it's time for a drink in the back corner. We can continue the discussion there. Thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate it.